Yeah, welcome everybody to the virtual version of the 3D DLAD workshop. Um, my name is Matthias Niesner and it's a real pleasure to talk about 3D deep learning and self-supervision. Of course, we've all been talking about you know, deep learning for quite a while. Um, and one thing, of course, we're very interested in is we want to capture the world in three dimensions, right? We, we, we put basically a lot of sensors right now on cars. We have laser sensors, we have LiDAR. Um, and all these kind of sensors we want to use in order to capture and understand the 3D environment. And eventually we want to use this kind of information in order to make machines such as autonomous cars or any other robots um, to autonomously interact with our environment. Now, in this talk, I would like to first talk a little bit about 3D understanding and a lot of the, the work I've I'm going to talk about is actually on indoor scenes, but in principle there is no difference on applying it also on sparse LiDAR, LiDAR data. Um, one of the things we've been working on for quite a while is under, understanding 3D scans, and for these kind of 3D scans we took RGBD sensors. Um, we've also had a couple of works right now on, on point clouds and LiDAR data. In principle, from a methodology standpoint, there's not a lot of difference. But of course I would like to argue that doing this in 3D makes a lot of sense, not just for spatial understanding, um, but there's other reasons why you want to do deep learning in 3D dimensions. And, and one of them is you don't have to learn the viewpoint invariance, meaning that if you're training networks in 3D dimensions, it's significantly easier and faster to train them and you don't need so much data. Um, for instance, you can train a point net from scratch in literally a day or two, um, whereas if you're training an ImageNet model from scratch, you probably have to train for one or two, two weeks, right? Um, but the thing I wanted to, to mention here is that in three dimensions for 3D scene understanding, we have actually seen quite, quite a bit of progress in the last few years. Um, and the traditional thing we've been working on is, is various computer vision tasks, such as semantic understanding. So we have labels on a, on a per surface point, on a per um, voxel vertex. And you know we, we training, we, we're training basically neural networks um, to give us a semantic scene understanding. Um, segmentation, of course, um, we detecting the objects, and we also want to kind of replicate the tasks that we have seen in 2D, such as from Coco and so on in 3D, right? Um, but of course, we don't just want to stop there in these low-level tasks, but we also want to go ahead and go to high-level tasks, such as, you know, understanding object functionality, affordances, human actions, and so on. Um, in our group, we've been working on, on specifically these tasks, and then we've been you know, started to work on this, um, we realized there's not a lot of data out there. And one of the first projects we've been doing was the, the ScanNet project, um, which essentially kickstarted a lot of these tasks in 3D um, indoor environments because we were one of the first that had a sufficiently large um, amount of 3D scenes um, that were densely annotated um, in order to do these kind of tasks. And this has evolved into the ScanNet benchmark challenge that, um, that we've been running since. Um, typically at CVPR conferences. Um, and we have now thousands of people and thousands of groups actually using this kind of data um, and trying to improve their own methods. But one thing we are particularly proud of is, uh, is the success here um, that we've seen on the benchmark itself. We have seen um, tremendous progress in terms of the absolute performance numbers, um, for instance, here on the semantic instance um, and semantic segmentation results. Um, yeah, you have seen many, many um, submissions, of course, to, 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 to scan at the, the 3D instant segmentation benchmark is one of the most popular ones, I would say, right now. Um, and what's pretty interesting is the IU numbers and the mean average position numbers, they actually gone up from like 0.2 or so to 0.6 now in the last two years. And I think that's quite, that, that's quite impressive, um, the progress we've been made here as a whole community on, 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 on 3D scene understanding. Now, all of these things I mentioned it are mostly based on um, yeah, on, on, on supervision, right? So we had to annotate all of these scenes and we have bounding boxes, we have semantic instances um, and, and all of these things, um, we had to put a lot of manual labor first in. Um, and one of the questions also that I wanted to make in this talk is can we basically go a step further and can we also exploit 3D scenes for self-supervision? And this is something I wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, I also wanted to raise um, another data set we've been working on was Matterport 3D. Um, this is also for indoor environments. It's um, done by, by Matterport. Um, it's a company that basically put a bunch of prime sense sensors on a tripod 
And um, with these ones you're getting building building scale reconstruction um, of indoor scenes um, looks something like this. We have also annotated these ones. We providing similar annotations than ScanNet for these ones. Um, the good thing about Matterport 3D is we have a bit more coverage in terms of the surface. We don't quite have that many views, um, but it's a kind of interesting complementary data set um, to ScanNet. Um, if you look a little bit closer, you're seeing results that look like these ones here. Now, for Matterport, we have um, we have actually also captured quite some. Uh, so Metaport has captured quite some data here that they, they offered us. Um, so we have 900 building scale scenes here. Um, we have about 200,000 R2BD images. And the, one of the advantage here is that this data is relatively um, motion blur free because um, this is on a tripod and not done by a human operator. But again, compared to the 2.5 million frames on Scanner, it's a little bit less data. So it has some pros and cons. But the thing, the reason why I'm mentioning Matterport 3D as part of this project, we didn't just want to, um, you know, publish some data. We also wanted to think about, oh, what can we do with it? Like, what are the right, what are the right methods to use it for? And this is what I already highlighted. I want to talk a little bit about 3D for self-supervision, and this is one of the things that we've already done in this paper. Actually, um, we thought, well, can we exploit 3D self-correlations? Um, that are already in the data without doing any manual annotations um, in order to train several tasks in computer vision. And I wanted to just mention a couple of them to just give you a little bit of perspective why I think in 3D you can do self-supervision pretty well. Um, one of the things we've been doing here was, for instance, we tried to uh, learn the matching of key points. And the idea is once you have a 3D scene and you're having a bunch of RGB images that were captured in the scene, and you use these RGB images, RGBD images, um, to get the reconstruction, you also have the poses of these images, right? So in this case, um, we're having here, this is our 3D scene, right? It's reconstructed. Um, we're having a bunch of images here that were used for this reconstruction. Um, and given that we have the poses, if we're taking, for instance, this point here, this red dot here, um, we are seeing this red dot in several images, right? So we're seeing this red dot here, 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 and here. So the nice thing is just by having a 3D reconstruction by itself, we can observe a single 3D point in several images. And this is kind of nice if you want to do something like learning and matching of key points, right? You can simply go ahead and, you know, pick your favorite um, Siamese architecture and you can go ahead and um, you know, extract this training data of your whatever triplets or, or just matches versus no matches um, from these key points here, right? Um, and this is pretty easy because um, if it's a static scene, right, you 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 inherently have these six stuff post constraints. So it's not just this one point that I could have picked here. I could literally pick any other arbitrary point. Um, then I could check um, which image or which set of images um, do see a specific point, and then we can extract patches around this point and can train our key point matcher, for instance. And this is something we've been done here, right? Um, and you compare it against some baselines. So here we have surf and sift as baselines. Um, so th this is the error rates here. They have pretty high error rates at 95% uh, at recall. And, and then you see, like, if you're using the self-supervised data from Metaport, which again, you get pretty much for free because you already have these poses, um, you can reduce the error, of course. Um, I don't want to make a big argument like what neural network architecture you want to use here, but I want to make an argument that it's very, very easy in, in 3D um, to get to get these kind of annotations for free, right? Because you just, you just need to do self-supervision. Um, you can do other tasks. This is something we've also tried, um, learning to predict viewpoint overlap. Again, if you have six stop poses, um, you can just literally see if there's any 3D overlap between the viewpoints. Um, and then you can go ahead and um, have a triplet loss, for instance, that tells you, oh, is there any overlap? Or you have a triplet plus a regression that tells you how much these images should respectively overlap. And you know, and we showed with a couple of relatively simple architectures here, um, we can do that. And again, it's purely self-supervised, and this is kind of nice. Um, you can do other things like estimate surface normals from RGB images. Again, if you have an RGBD image, you already have the depth for free, and then you can train this color to, to normal prediction. 
uh, you can also do color to depth prediction for free, right? Um, of course, this is relatively straightforward. I also don't want to make a claim here right now that, oh, this is the best architecture. But what I want to make again is if you're thinking about, you know, self-supervised representation learning, 3D data is really nice because you can have a lot of tasks that you derive just from the data itself um, in order in order to give you good features for pre-training, for instance, but also in terms of facilitating a lot of tasks. Sorry. But the one thing I wanted to talk a little bit more in detail right now is actually about generative tasks, right? And by generative tasks, you know, most people um, in computer vision or even computer graphics and machine learning would say, we're often talking about a reconstruction problem um, if you're talking about 3D data. Um, and one specific task that we've been working on for quite a while is the completion of 3D shape because we have this kind of, you know, like goal that we would love to capture 3D environments and with these 3D environments, um, we would eventually have digital replica of the real world. We would love to understand them. We would love to memorize them and so on. So the idea is um, in this simple task here of completing three shapes, we have kind of a partial 3D reconstruction um, of a 3D object. And then we want to train a neural network that gets us essentially um, a completed version of that. Yeah, and, and the way you're doing this, and again, there's a lot of architectures here, of course, um, how you could realize that is um, for the most part, we having um, ground truth data for that, and in this case, um, this, this for the specific method, we use ShapeNet, um, which probably a lot of people know, right? Um, we having here the input, we having ground truth ShapeNet models from which we generated the input by partially scanning them virtually, um, and then we training our network um, to make sure that we correlate our input with the ground truth, and this is in the middle here, um, is what the network produces, and it works remarkably well if you have even like you know this partial table here, right, we can complete quite a substantial amount and, and you know, the detail is also not, not too bad. So this is kind of nice um, in terms of that we can show that we can, of course, train generative networks on 3D data. Um, but the, the challenges at some point is going to be all of these things right now are on ShapeNet. And there's a lot of papers <laughs> that use ShapeNet because that's one of the few data sets actually that is available in synthetic um, 3D models. Um, but getting this stuff to work actually on real data is a whole different challenge, right? So if you're thinking about real 3D scenes, well, you first of all have to figure out stuff how to operate on large volumes, right? It's not like an image that you constrain to some fixed size uh, 2D array, but in this case, every 3D scene could kind of have arbitrary dimensions. So this is something we've been working on too. You can use fully convolutional networks in 3D, right? You train on parts, on chunks. Um, then you can do this on the entirety of the scenes. Um, but at the same time, you also have to figure out this data problem I mentioned before, because many of these data sets are synthetic nature, so we can train a generative model on, on synthetic data, but then we have to figure out how this translates to the real data. And, and this is, I think, a pretty, a pretty challenging job, because what we would love to have is, we would love to have real 3D data, real 3D scans, and would love to have an artist model the, the synthetic scenes around it. But, but sadly, in, in the academic world, this is, at least at the moment, it seems not data that is accessible, right? Um, and even for, for self-driving car data sets, this, this is pretty far away from what, what we have available. If you're looking at the popular Kitty, Vimo data sets and so on, it's, it's just very challenging to get that um, because you have large 3D environments that you have a sparse point cloud for. You just don't have the ground truth data for the completed or reconstructed 3D meshes. Yeah, so the question is basically, can we do this task of, you know, of, of generative um, 3D neural networks of uh, scene completion, scene reconstruction from sparse data, can we, can we do this also in a self-supervised way? Uh, and this is one project we've been working on very recently, um, and this was Angela Dye leading it. Um, we had, we had self-supervised, we had this idea of self-supervised scan completion. And the idea here is we're having a set of um, depth frames. So in this case, we're having um, a series of depth frames here, right? These are just uh, depth images that we recorded. Um, and what you can go ahead to do is you just do standard 3D reconstruction, right? So we could go ahead and say, well, we're running our favorite method, such as in this case, um, I think we used voxel hashing, um, and we're getting a, 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 3D, a 3D reconstruction here. Um, that looks something like this, right? So there's no learning right now. All we're doing right now is we're doing standard reconstruction. 
Um, we're taking the series of depth frames, we're running a pose estimation, um, in, the, in this case we're using the, uh, the Matterport scenes, so we have the poses given in the data set already, but in practice you have some sort of um, you know, bundle adjustment method or so, or some slam method, and you know, if we're taking these depth frames here, what we're getting, uh, uh, we're getting a reconstruction like these ones, if we're combining it all together, we're fusing it, and with volumetric fusion, following the, the, the popular Curlis and Lavoie method, um, we're getting this target scan as an output. Uh, so as I said, there's there's not a lot of learning here right now, right? All we've been doing, we just ran a standard standard 3D reconstruction method. And if you see, right, I mean, it looks good, right? We have a lot of data, we have a lot of coverage here in this data set, um, but we're still having a lot of holes, of course, right? So we're having a lot of, a lot of pieces still missing, and what we would love to do is we would love to figure out how to complete those. Um, but as I said right now, for real data, we don't have the actual ground truth. So we don't know what the 3D final completed model should look like. And one idea of the self-supervision here is, well, we could go ahead and say, well, we don't have the full model, but we have a partial model and we can make it less partial. So what we're doing is, instead of taking all of these depth frames here, we're removing two of these depth frames, and with these two of these depth frames, we're essentially removing some parts of the 3D reconstruction here. So we're making this partial scan even less partial. Right? So if we're removing these two frames here, uh, we're getting something that looks like this. Um, these are not actually the two frames we removed. We removed um, a certain percentage of the input frames here. Um, so now what we have here is we have two sets of reconstructions. One of these reconstructions was done with using all the available depth frames, and one of them was being done with only a subset of the uh, depth frames. And the idea here is that we are saying, well, we are correlating these two to each other and training a network that learns kind of the delta between those two. Um, and the way you can do this relatively easily is we know here well, so we could just go ahead and, and, and make sure we're predicting this one from that one, right? But what we really want to do is we want to also figure out what actually was missing here at the beginning. And this is a nice thing about um, when you're running volumetric fusion, um, you're actually getting a sine distance field in 3D. And from the sine distance field in 3D, you're actually knowing which are the pieces that are missing. Um, and this is essentially where the sign is negative. This, um, whenever you're having a depth map, right, everything behind the depth map is unknown, that's negative, and everything in front of it is positive. This is, if this is a little bit too deep, I would recommend look up again the Curlis and Lavoie method. It's relatively easy to get this kind of um, state observation. So what we know here in this target scan, we know actually what are the things that are unobserved and what are the things that are observed. We do know the same about this input scan as well here. But the nice trick what we can do here is we can force the input scan to make predictions everywhere where you have observed regions in the target scan. And everything that is unobserved, you're going to mask out. So you don't have a loss there. So you have only a partial loss that tells you from the very partial scan here in the middle, go to the less partial scan here on the right, and the losses only define the regions where we know the target scan has actually observations. And this is completely self-supervised, which is very, very nice, because we don't need any annotations. The only thing what we're doing here is we're taking an existing 3D scan, and we're removing a bunch of frames, so we're making it less complete, and then we're correlating the two to each other, and then we have this nice masking trick of the unobserved space in the targets, and then we can train this end to end. Um, we also proposing a few things on the architecture side here, um, if you're curious how that one looks in detail. Uh, in this case here we have an input scan. We have a sparse encoder. Uh, then we have kind of a bottleneck in a sense, but this bottleneck is a dense predictor, so we, we're having sparse convolutions here. Um, so we're following um, you know, this paper from Ben Graham and um, also Chris Choi, the, the Minkowski engine. We're essentially following the conf operators um, that operate only on the surface in the sparse regions here. And, and then we have the dense prediction here in the middle that runs on everything. So we want to have a lot of communication between regions that are even further apart. Um, and then we have this sparse 
generative decoder, and then we're getting the final reconstruction here as the output. This is sparse TSDF that we're getting. Um, and this unit architecture has skip connections, and we also have here intermediate occupancy losses that we're formulating as a binary cross entropy, respectively, that you know does this hierarchical um, hierarchical completion. So on the architecture side, it's also quite interesting because we have this sparse generative architecture, and this is um, I think the most, probably the first paper that did this. Um, we're actually getting pretty good uh, results with that architecture um, because we can go to very high resolutions. And so the nice thing is now is we can take an existing 3D scan, right? We do the self-supervised trick, and then we're getting this high resolution geometry out of it at the end of the day. Um, and the results look something like that. So here's the input scan, respectively. Here's the completion. And if you look at the side by side, it looks actually pretty good, right? Um, this is the target scan that we're trying to complete here. You're seeing that even the target scan is pretty incomplete. It's never perfect here. Um, but our completion actually manages to fill in these missing regions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it again because I think this works actually remarkably well. We can go to very high resolutions now. Uh, we can train a lot of data because we don't need any annotations. Um, and we're getting, of course, um, pretty, pretty good results, right? Um, so here's the input. Here's our prediction. Here was the respective target. And we see that we're even fixing these kind of things here. Um, even if you're looking at this um, quantitatively, um, we're also seeing, of course, um, quite some improvements. Um, we had here um, a couple of different methods, Poisson service reconstruction. This is kind of our standardized baseline that we're always running. It's easy to run. Um, we're having SSCNet. Um, we're having 3D EPN. That's also supervised. We're having ScanComplete. That's the interesting one. So ScanComplete basically runs on the entirety of a scene, has a hierarchical architecture. It looks pretty good, but the challenge here that scan complete has to be trained in a supervised fashion. And they don't have this unsupervised trick, right? Or self-supervised trick. And because of that, it just works much better what we're doing. Uh, we also have an ablation study. So lower here is, of course, better. There's an L1 error with respect to the unknown um, regions. Um, we also have here um, a self-supervised uh, scan completion evaluation um, when we do or do not use the mask. And I think that's pretty interesting. So this masking, I think this is pretty important. If you don't have, if you're trying to complete everything and predicting even stuff where you don't have ground truth for, um, then it looks significantly worse. So for instance, you're not getting these regions here right because most of the ground truth didn't have these regions either. But if you do it, the masking, you're actually going to get pretty good predictions. So here for the bathtub, or here for these chairs, right? Um, or even here at the top. You're getting pretty good um, predictions. And I think that's pretty nice. Um, we also had a couple of ablations where we have varying degrees of target incompleteness for training, right? Um, so I think this is pretty interesting in a sense. Like, basically, we can, we can vary. Um, how much or how many frames we have in the respective target. And what's pretty interesting, it doesn't actually it doesn't actually change too much. So here we have these are different, these are four different metrics basically, right? Um, and but it, it's interesting, like if you have 30 to 50%, you're almost getting the same that you have 50%, right? So like this is not changing too much, which is kind of a very interesting thing, actually, I feel. Um, so the model in a sense is not so relying on Oh, for a specific sample, how incomplete is it? But the reason why this still works for things that are relatively incomplete um, is because we just have a lot of, uh, yeah, we have a lot of data for it, right? We have not just one sample, but it basically learns over the sa samples that you had certain patterns that you already saw. Um, so now we, we thought, how can we push this even a little bit further? So now we're doing self-supervision on 3D. Now, one question what we had is, can we also add color at the same time and not just predict the geometry? Um, so the idea was we have this input scan and then we predict the 3D uh, scene with the color to it. Um, so we thought, well, this should have been pretty pretty easy. And we thought two weeks before the CVPR deadline last year, hmm, we're just gonna, just gonna add the color here, right? Um, and the idea then was, well, we have this partial import here, right? We have our, our self-supervision again, as before. Um, and we tried it out, and we realized if we're just adding the color, this didn't work out at all. And there were many reasons for it. Um, and one reason was that the color had actually higher resolution. So um, this one didn't quite fit well with the geometry.
But there was another thing what we felt we left on the table. So currently what we're doing is we're having partial scan and correlating it with the even less partial scan. But you can also do self-supervision with the respective underlying RGB images. So the idea here is you can take an input scan, um, you can have a predicted 3D scan, um, but you don't have a loss with respect or in addition to losses that you might have on a 3D geometry, you're making sure that you have a self-supervised loss on the few re uh, viewpoint reprojection. So you're having the RGB images here, right? And what we're doing right now is we're saying we have an input scan, we're having a network that completes the input scan, predicts the surface colors, then we are rendering the target scan, what we are predicting into the respective target RGB views that we observed, comparing them and having a loss only here in 2D. And the idea is that our observed RGB images, these are these ones here on the right, these ones here are always complete. These are RGB images, right? There's nothing missing there. Um, so the assumption is that we have enough RGB images in the channel eyes. Um, this way we can basically complete the geometry and the color textures on the surface by this reprojection loss. Um, we call this few guided synthesis, right? So what we're doing is the simplest way is we can just say, well, our 2D geometry in these reprojections has to match. Um, we can also add a 2D perceptual loss. Um, in this case, we're just using a bunch of VGG features that are pre-trained um, as a loss function. Uh, we can even have a GAN loss here that tells us, well, we're reprojecting these ones here, and this one has to be from the distribution that we have in here, and we can have a conditional loss. Right? And again, the, the thing what we're doing here in this work, we're going a step further in not just considering the 3D geometry in itself as self-supervision, but we're also constraining these self-supervised reprojections as supervision. Right? Um, in practice, it looks something like this. Um, we have a differentiable raycast here. Uh, we have here 3D input, right? Um, we have a camera viewpoint. Um, we are raycasting this one. Um, based on this one, we're getting 2D output. Um, and then we know how we have to change the 3D geometry, the sign distance function, um, as well as the surface colors based on the re-rendering. And we tried out a couple of different things. I already mentioned we had different losses, like the 3D geometry in 2D needs to match in the depth map. Um, also, the, um, the, the color could be done with an adversarial loss or with a perceptual loss. Right? Um, so let's have a look how this looks like. Um, well, if you have an input scan here uh, and we're having an L1 loss only on the respective 2D views, then we're getting something that looks like this. It looks a bit blurry, um, but you already see we're getting, we're getting actually some reasonable completion here, which is nice. right? Um, when we're adding the L1 perceptual loss, it gets a bit sharper. Um, but you're losing a bit of the saturation here. Um, this is the experience that we made here. We try to tweak it a little bit, but it's, it's a bit tricky to get it to run. Um, but if we're adding um, the advers and if you're doing only the adversarial, then it gets a bit sharper, but we're losing open like what made this scene this scene. And if you're combining them all together, we're actually getting quite a reasonable prediction here, right? Um, so this is the input, and this is what we're getting here as an output. But remember, this is not the image that we're getting, actually. We're actually getting the full 3D scene. Um, but the real beauty here of this one is that if you're comparing this one to SGNN, what you have seen before, uh, we are actually getting better geometry as well. So this is an evaluation only in the geometry. By having this extra 2D self-supervision, by making sure we have consistent reprojections into all the other frames, we actually getting, if you're looking, the chamfer distance here goes down quite a bit, and also the IOU here with respect to the geometry goes up quite a bit, and we're evaluating it on that approach. Um, so this is kind of a nice thing. So it's actually 2D supervision helps even more if you're doing this in a self-supervised way, which is kind of a really nice result, and visually this looks actually quite a bit better. Okay, um, we're having here um, also an evaluation on, on FID, um, FID scores, um, we're evaluating, it. we try to um, well, make PFO work for this example in texture fields was the previous method and we're getting of course shorter images um, because of the design of our losses and so on. Um, if you're looking at some qualitative results, it looks like this. Again, here we have input, um, texture fields here does something but it always smooths a little bit um, and ours looks actually remarkably good here. And we look even better than the respective targets um, in the target, you often have motion blurred frames, um, so our reconstructions 
um, look for the most part actually a little bit better. Okay, here's a final video. Here we see a final scene that we ran through our method. And I would say, you know, it's getting there. We're getting pretty good geometry um, and we're getting also pretty good uh, colors. Let me show this one again. Again, this is the input here. And this is what we're getting then as the output in our final reconstruction. And the nice thing is, it's again, it's completely self-supervised. We didn't have to use any like 3D models or so that artists had a model. And I think this is a pretty cool thing. Um, and I feel this could work for a lot of um, a lot of a lot of applications. So what's next? Well, um, of course, we're having a lot of 3D reconstructions, right? Um, um, I should say I have talked right now a lot about indoor reconstruction, but I would I love to get these methods to work also on outdoor reconstructions, and this is something we're trying right now, right? We would love to get this to work on like on like Kitty Vimo data and so on, where we have extremely sparse um, depth points um, and so on. Okay, um, well. This is typically what we are looking at 3D reconstructions, but the final goal, of course, is we want to go a step further, right? We want to make sure this looks like computer graphics. Um, and I believe this is really exciting. Of course, we want to get better reconstructions. There's also cool directions right now in neural rendering. Um, but I, I think once we're getting from here to here, it will not just help the visuals, it will also help the respective representations. Um, and self-supervised training is one of these things where we're getting basically good features for free. Um, yeah, and I think that's, Pretty exciting. Um, I hope there's going to be more work coming out of there. And I would also like to thank all the people who were working on it, um, specifically Angela Dai, who has done um, yeah, most of these uh, works that I've just presented and was also in collaboration with a couple of other people here. So yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so this, I guess, would be the time for questions. I think we probably have to take it offline if you're interested in these areas feel free to shoot me an email. We're also very happy to collaborate remotely. Um, we're also recruiting students and interns at the same time. Um, yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot.